All righty. Uh, welcome to tonight's uh, community preservation meeting, uh, Monday, March 29th, 2021, 6 o'clock. Uh, pursuant to the open meeting laws, any person may make an audio or video recording of this public meeting or may, may transmit the meeting through any medium. Attendees are therefore advised that such recording or transmissions are being made, whether perceived or unperceived, by those present, deemed, acknowledged, and permissible. Uh, we'll start with roll call. Christine Oliveira? Present. Christine here? Present. Paul Machado? Present. John Ferreira? Present. Alex Sylvia? Present. Carolyn Auburn? Present. And then we have our new committee member, uh, Danielle Pixley? Here? Present. Uh, oh, Victor Farias. <laughs> tonight's uh, commission. John. John, Victor yeah. Farias. Victor Farias. What did I say? You got to call Victor Farias. Oh, Victor, I'm sorry. Victor Farias? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. And, and I... just con... Okay. Just confirm that they're all here remotely. Okay. Uh, commissioners are participating remotely tonight on Zoom. The following are John Brandt, Christine Oliveira, Victor Farias, Paul Machado, John Ferrer, Alex Sylvia, Carolyn Auburn, and Danielle Pixley. Um, this meeting is available through viewing through Fred TV and on uh, demand channel 18. Uh, we have a citizen input tonight from uh, Al Lima from 488 Hood Street, Fall River. Uh, I'm writing regarding the application before the committee, committee preservation committee for the next funding cycle. My apologies for approaching you through a letter, but the current pandemic is few options. I felt the phone call would have been adequate to provide all the information that may help your decision. The application in question is a Quicker Shan Falls walkway conceptual design and feasibility study. Stuart Sagamore of the State uh, Community Preservation Coalition had mentioned the Community Preservation Acts allow funding of a feasibility study of this kind. However, he recommends that this kind of study should be prepared by the forward planning department. He may not realize the technical requirements in requiring such a study, nor does he realize that the planning department of Fall River consists of just one person. There is no way that the current planning department can accomplish this task without assistance of outside consultants. Daylight in the Falls of Quick Sham River has been discussed by the public and public officials for many decades, but no action has ever been taken to make this happen. The Community Preservation Committee could provide the opportunity to finally take the first steps by providing funding for this study. This will show the public what could happen when the falls appear to help revitalize downtown as it happened already in other communities that have taken on similar projects. This is a time to let the world know that the reason Fall River is called by the name is that a real falls actually exists in the city. It is time to let the waters flow again to show the citizens of Fall River that we have the right here in our city. The application fulfills three of the CPA <coughs> categories, open space, recreation, and historic preservation. This is a great opportunity to realize something that could be a major accomplishment for the city, benefiting both city residents and visitors. As was written about Greenfield, a textile town in South Carolina about its revitalized falls. Falls Park draws residents and visitors downtown, unlike other Main Street attractions. The falls were already part of downtown. Greenfield's natural focus Point. just needed some attention to highlight its beauty. This project was center and beginning of a downtown revitalization that was modeled for other cities. The CPC could really make the same great renaissance happen here. Uh, thank you so much for your work as a member of the community preservation. Uh, sincerely, Alfred Lima. Uh, next, could I have a uh, motion for approval of the minutes, uh, March 15th, 2021? I'll make a motion to approve. Second. A second. Uh, roll call, Christine? Yes. Victor Ferris? Yes. Paul Machado? Yes. John Ferreira? Yes. Uh, Alex Sylvia? Yes. Carolyn Auburn? Yes. 
Okay, then Danielle was not at the uh, that meeting, so to abstain. Uh, vote passes on that. Next one is approval of the minutes for March 22nd, 2021. Can I have a motion? Make a motion to accept the minutes for March 22nd, 2021. Uh, second. A second. Okay. Uh, roll call, Christine Oliveira? Yes. Victor Ferris? Yes. Paul Machado? Yes. John Ferreira? Yes. Alex Sylvia? Yes. Carolyn Auburn? Yes. And Danielle was not at that meeting, and uh, I vote yes, so uh, minutes pass. Uh, first on tonight's agenda for the FY22 funding hearing is the Fall River School Department, the man's murals. Um, John, Joyce was going to call in, but I don't see her up here, so I don't know if someone wants to make a motion to... Sandy. Yes. It, she had emailed me and she said that if she wasn't on there, she asked if I could give her a call. So okay. what I can do is I can put her on speakerphone. Okay. Okay. So just okay. give me a minute and I'll do that. <clears throat> okay. This uh, application was changed to, uh, to do a digital uh, re-enhance of the uh, man murals. Um, which I have a call in the steward. I don't think that the CPC funds um, do reproductions, but uh, we'll let Joyce give us her spill. Okay, I have Joyce here on speakerphone, so. Okay, Joyce, would you like to tell us about your project? I'm sorry, that didn't, that didn't come in very clearly. Could you repeat that? Yes, would you like to tell us about your project? I know I see that you changed it to uh, replace and cleaning with a uh, high resolution digital photograph. Can you tell us about that? He's, he's asking if you can tell us about the project because it was changed. Okay, I have Joyce here. You have to you have to turn your TV down, Joyce, because I can hear it in the background. Uh, turn it down. It's um yeah. Let me try that. How's that? Okay, that's fine. So you just need to tell us about the project. Because I know you had changed something originally, so John is asking for you to give us a an update. Okay, uh, I think you have a letter in <laughs> front of you. Yes. Yeah. All right. Can we hear me now? Yep, we can hear you. All right. I I know that I submitted a letter. You probably have that in front of you. A letter to Jim Souza. Yep. And there's a short amendment to the application that I submitted in January. Uh, the letter summarizes changes that are necessary uh, to that application uh, simply because more research that I've done indicates that murals do not need to be cleaned. Uh, we can go right ahead and start preparing a test on how to photograph them. Uh, at this point, I'm at a standstill because I don't have any information from the building committee, Jersey High School.
Capital Building Committee on exactly where the murals will be positioned. And that is due to the fact that the man, uh, the Naval Auditorium is under construction. So I, I can't move forward. All I have is information from a photographer that uh, is telling me that he needs to have a prep test and he needs to have information on exactly the dimensions that will be provided by the school department. And I, I don't have that information at this point, so this is where I'm at. Okay. Um, We'll ask uh, if any board member has any questions. Christine, do you have any questions? I, I can't move forward. Uh, if, what, what we need to do um, is to get information from the project manager at Jersey and the architects. Then we can set up a test and the product that the photographer will give us has, has to be approved by the school department and then we can go ahead and actually come up with a budget. <clears throat> so I'm at a standstill and I, I don't know what, uh, what how we can proceed from this. Okay. Uh, we'll ask uh, Christine, do you have any questions on this? Uh, not at the moment, no. How about Victor, any questions? Not at the moment. Uh, Paul Machado, any questions? No. Uh, John, any questions? No. Uh, Alex, any questions? No questions. All righty. Uh, Caroline, any questions? Not at this time. Okay. Danielle, any questions? No. Okay. All right. Well, thank you uh, for Tell us about your project. We'll consider it. Thanks. All right. Next on the agenda was uh, the North Burial Gatehouse. They're requesting fifty-seven thousand to refurbish and reinstall the decorative iron gates at the entrance. Uh, we have done uh, projects down there before. In uh, six Y sixteen, we did one hundred and four thousand for exterior repairs to the gatehouse. So, uh, Chris, why don't you yeah, tell us about yeah. this? How are you today? Good. How are you doing? Oh, we're doing good. Um, so, what we're looking for is on the gatehouse is to, um, we're doing the masonry. Uh, it's been quite a while um, on the uh, on the gatehouse. Um, it is uh, in motion right now. Um, so, go ahead and do the masonry, um, not only on the building and the facade, uh, but also to do the columns that were are uh, knocked down. Um, but while we're doing that, we want to be able to do the gates at the same time because when they rebuild those columns that are on North Main Street, right on the street and sidewalk level, those columns have um, parts of the hinges that are inside those columns that the gates would sit on. Um, the gates were, were for a long time stored <coughs> in uh, Bullet Tree next to the Oak Grove Cemetery. Uh, they were quite buried inside the woods there. We've taken them out since then. Uh, we have them. Uh, and Key and Mike Keen have taken a look at them uh, to give us an estimate of what we think we take to refurbish them. Uh, pretty much similar to what we did to Oak Grove Cemetery for those gates. And how we refurbished those gates and brought them back to life. <coughs> um, so when we do this masonry work, uh, we're able to install those gates at the same time. So that's kind of our, our method of what we're trying to look for is trying to get the gates now out of this project. All right. Now, on restoring them, are you going to be able to reuse the hinges and the gates, almost everything? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Looking at them in that, there is, there's a couple of pieces that are bent on them um, that we're going to have fixed, and then they will get, um, uh, I'm assuming, sandblasted. They'll get repainted um, and stuff like that. And then we can reinstall the hinges that actually go into the masonry. But we need to straighten the gates out at the same time they're doing this because they can put the hinges back in the exact same spot where they belong so that we can line the, the gates up. Okay. Now tell me, is there any uh, 
plans on using this uh, space for um, like educational or history? I know when yeah, we first I mean, talked about it. Uh, I think that's been some of the, um, the talks, um, in, again, being the conditions that there are, you know, we, we still got some work to do, uh, but that has been things in the past that have been talked about. Um, uh, I believe uh, Christian Oliveira knows about some of the things that we, we've talked about is uh, the Oak Road Cemetery, making that like a, almost like a kind of a gift shop where it has uh, etchings of stones. Um, there's a lot of people uh, historic. Uh, people that come down to look at them. There's a lot of students that come down to look at both these cemeteries um, and do uh, papers on them uh, historically. Um, so there's, there's, there's quite a bit to both these cemeteries that people are quite interested in. And we feel that by making these areas uh, more functional, um, able to, people can actually come inside. Uh, you can open it up to them. They'll have more information. I know uh, Mr. Perry, who is the, the director of uh, the cemeteries, uh, has been doing a lot to get all of the uh, information that we've had that have been in cards and pieces of paper to get into the computer system. So people can actually come in, look it up on the computer, find exactly where the location that they're looking for, be able to go to that plot and be able to do whatever it is that they would like to do, whether they wanted to take up uh, an etching of the stone where they put a piece of paper on it and trace it and, uh, take pictures and things of that nature. I know there was talk about uh, before the COVID happened, um, they wanted to do like little bus tours of historic things that we have here in our city between uh, the cemeteries, between um, uh, Lizzie Borden's and, and things of all of that nature that kind of have a, a, a significant history to our city. Okay. Uh We'll open it up for questions. Christine, you have any questions? Um, yeah, so where does the projected cost of the $50,000 come from? Because I don't see any kind of a breakdown. It's, um, it's based on our experience when we restored um, Oak Grove Cemetery in the Great Square. <clears throat> So it's, this project is, we would have to get, uh, we have to determine what the, the cost is to see how that affects the public bidding laws in the city of the site. So we can't just get quotes, we've got to just follow the procurement. So it's a general estimation of what we've had and encountered in the past of, of costs. Um, the original cemetery gates. So this is an estimated cost. Looking at what needs to be done to these gates in a couple of hours, the sandblasting and the painting. Um, this is what we've estimated. But again, until we actually go out and do the public procurement piece, it's it's a, it's a cost estimation. Okay. Uh, Vic, any questions? Uh, not right now, John. Okay. Paul. Uh, Any questions, Paul? Yes, Mr. Gallagher, you indicate that the work from the prior um, funds is currently being done? From the prior funds? No, the prior, the prior uh, CPA funds. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. work is now getting done? Yes, it's all under contract. It's all been uh, procured and all of that. Okay. What, what was the reason for the delay? Well, we had uh, a, a few, uh, few, few reasons and um, ones that we've had uh, another architect that was originally uh, looking at this. Um, there was different things. It was kind of underfunded. We kind of then um, subsequently went to another architectural firm. Um, and we're now with uh, uh, CivTech, who actually uh, got the bidding, got all of that stuff done, all the coding, everything that we've went through for the funding and uh, have put it out and now signed contracts through a contractor who is getting started, who is already set up there and is getting started. We uh, put in temp electric so we can get the electric off the building so we can do the socket and roof work. Uh, we just worked on the water line today. We just found out that the gate valve in the street and the sidewalk was broken, so they dug it up and fixed that today for us. So we, we are getting ready to full swing for the summer. Thank you. Uh, John, any questions? I'm good right now. Okay. Alex, any questions? Yeah, I have one question. Mr. Gallagher, uh, so will this gate 
fully secure the cemetery now, or how, what would the perimeter's security be like after the completion of this gate? Well, there is, is uh, there's a fence like you can see that goes all the way around the property. Um, that fence is intact. It's, it's old, it's dated, but it's intact. Um, the back uh, fence, I think, what is four to six feet high. But yes, this gate now will allow to, to close off that cause just can't drive in there at night and go in there and stuff. These gates will be able to be closed and will be able to close, just like we do Oak Grove. At sunset, um, the, the gates are locked. Okay. Thanks. Uh, okay. Oh, well said. Uh, Caroline, any questions? Not at this time. Uh, Danielle, any questions? No. Oh, okay. All right. Moving on to the next one is uh, the Bank Street Armory. We did have a call from the city to uh, uh, remove this from tonight's funding. But uh, Chris, if you could send us a formal letter that uh, you're requesting to withdraw on that, but we could have that on file. Uh, is, is there any way um, that we can go through this and then maybe just put it on hold? Um, they're in the process of possibly uh, looking to sell the property and things of that nature. Um, but if it doesn't go through, um, I, I'd like to be able to have this either at a future meeting, um, even though it's not a funding hearing, or be able to do it tonight. If you're willing to, to fund the meeting, then we hold the funds. Uh, because if it doesn't sell or nothing happens with it, I'd really like to do this roof. This, this roof is, um, is in desperate need. We are doing everything we can. Um, every, every storm that we have, anytime we have any type of rain, snow, We've been there maintaining it, trying to stop any water infiltration. We've, we've coated it several times. Uh, we do different things to, to, to stop any water. Um, and I just want to make sure that it just doesn't fall by the wayside and we've got to wait a whole other year to go to funding. Um, if for some reason it falls through, um, if we can go through this and we put it on hold and they do sell it, then maybe he can come to the board um, and, and ask if these funds could go forward. Um, but I, I just think putting, putting it on hold is okay. I just hate to remove it and we can't revisit it. Um, if in a month or two, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, happen and come to fruition that we're able to be able to revisit this right away because it is something that needs to be done. Um, I, I know the building isn't quite used right now, um, but we've done already a good portion of the roof. Uh, the gymnasium is all slate and it, it does not leak in any any fashion in that area. But this upper roof is, is in pretty tough shape and, and does need to be replaced. And I just hate to see this have to wait, you know, another year, year and a half before we can go back to fixing it if it doesn't sell or if it sells, the gentleman can come back to you for it. So uh, I leave it up to you, Mr. Chairman, if, if we could do something like that or that we could just revisit this um, going forward. Uh, we, we can discuss it. I, I, I know being that it's up for sale, it's probably going to be tough vote for us to take because, um, doing with the deed restriction, I mean, we can go ahead and, and, and you can tell us about it. I mean, you're requesting $571,486, uh, to remove and replace the flat roof and remove and replace structural roof and framing members. Uh, remove and replace uh, copper flashing. Uh, uh, I mean, that's what you really want to do. I don't think you have any estimates, do you, on that? That's. Uh, we did it uh, through Stock Architect. Uh, I believe that you should have that um, in that part of that um, package. And I think it was in the uh, study that we gave to um, not only the CPC, but also to Historic Preservation uh, Historic Committee. Um, these were all done, and I thought it was attached, maybe uh, it didn't attach it. Um, but we did have it attached, it was estimated by stock architects, not only through uh, construction values and stuff like that of rebuilding, but also through his uh, study that he did on the building. We had quite an extensive uh, feasibility study done on that, and the manners in which we want to uh, complete <coughs> Doing any project, when you do something of this size or nature, you always want to stop from the top down. You always want to make sure you take care of your roof. Try to stop that water infiltration. Work your sides, work your outer envelope, and then you can concentrate on interior. Um, it's, it's kind of the right way to go about doing um, any type of preservation of this because you need to stop the water infiltration. So, um, 
like I said, what you were saying, I can get it to you. If for some reason you don't have it, you should have the full quality of the estimates within that. Um, that we just kind of upgraded because every year goes by, it's like a four percent escalation cost. Um, is, is kind of the standard in the industry um, that architects and, and professional estimators put on things because they know if you don't do the project right away, you do it the following year, or by the time we get the funds, it, it, there's always a cost increase. So. Um, that's where we kind of are there. I also have um, in here that it was a possible uh, of $100,000 from CDA, uh, maybe able to give a possible of $100,000 to the project as well. Um, yeah, CDA. Okay. So how uh, do we we'll, just put, we put it on hold, that, that, that'd be fine. And if you want to, if I just want to be able to come and revisit it if something doesn't happen, uh, just because, you know, I, I really, really think that this step that needs it. I'd really um, hate to lose that new from these days. All right. Well, we'll see. Um, any kind of questions, Christine? Do you have any questions? Um, yeah. Have you um, at, tried at all to get any kind of grants from the state to do any work on the building? Because I know um, it's on it's on the national register and on the, on the state city register, and also um, the the armory has a permanent deed restriction on it, like a permanent permanent deed restriction on it. So I know it should be eligible for some type of grant. So have you looked at that at all? Yeah, I've got some um, Jane DiDiagio, the grant writer, and we've been looking into some of that stuff. Some of it lately because of COVID and all of those other things from last year, it just kind of put things on the wayside. But um, before that, we had been looking at some of them, but some of them didn't quite fit the criteria of what we needed to make to get to them. But now there's a lot more coming out now. So we're hoping that we can do something to that effect as well. And I'm sure if the new owner is going to take over, I'm, 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 I'm sure he's going to go in that direction as well. Okay. Um, Vic, any questions? Not at this moment. All right. Paul, any questions? Um, yes. Mr. Gallagher, uh, do you have any discretionary maintenance funds that you can use to preserve various buildings every year? I do. I use my general budget. I have a, a, my in my general budget and stuff like that. I have a, I have a hundred thousand dollars in my general budget for other professional services, which I use a lot for architects and stuff. But sometimes I'll use it um, to hire um, carpenters or roofers or something that I can't do in house. I'll do that. We are currently in this year. We're going to try to put in a little more money in my budget to be able to do things like this to be able to do some bigger projects. Um, and run it out of the out of that instead of always having to go to city council uh, for funding and stuff and bonds and things like that. We're going to try to do that. I have a very talented crew right now um, that I have um, that are working for me. My carpenters um, and stuff like that. They uh, I'm getting electricians and plumbers. I had lost uh, a couple of them, so uh, now uh, uh, I'm allowed to get back some of them. Um, but I've got some talented people, and we, we we try to maintain what we can and the funds we have. Um, but this is something that's very large and a little bit beyond our scope of work. So, um, like I said, there's some structural stuff that really has to be fixed here. Uh, we can keep patching it and we can go along, but it can stop that and get into the structure part of it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, John, any questions? Not right now. Uh, Alex, any questions? Not right now, thanks. Okay. Caroline, any questions? Not right now. Uh, Danielle? Not right now. Thank you. Okay. All right, Chris. We'll uh, we'll keep this, but I, I I think it might be better to uh, we'll we'll keep it in consideration. But I think we might want to hold this one till uh, the new owners take over and they can apply. They might have different ideas what they want to do with the building. So instead of us getting into a deed restriction or something, we might take a look at that and see where it heads. Alrighty. And John, very much. I just maybe in the future if something could happen, I'd like to be able to come back to the board. Okay. Yes, John. Sir. Um, do you want me to scan in and email all the new members the study that Chris mentioned? Because we do, I do have a copy of the study, Chris, that you gave me. I can scan that in and send it to all of the new committee members because they yes, probably they don't have it. At least you can all see it. And yes, then you I'm can sure talk about this at deliberation too. Okay. And if you like, I can make copies. I, I have the, I, I can make copies and then we can just pass them out so they have the full 
a full book with something to this effect that's on the fire museum for that. Day. <coughs> Okay, Chris, that would be that would be a good idea because it's a thick document and this way yeah. so they don't have to print it and it'll be in color. Just let me know when they're all ready. I would do um, seven copies. Not a problem. I'll okay. Sure that a book. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. All right. Next up on the agenda is the uh, Maplewood Park. Uh, they're requesting um, four hundred and ninety-eight thousand. $564 to uh, remove and replace uh, existing lightings at the uh, Maplewood Ballpark. Uh, they have approval from the uh, Park Department and uh, Nancy Smith was very high on it. And uh, I, I, I think this is a, a nice project with, from my own consideration. Uh, it's something that's gonna be used and uh, really add to the, uh, the kids and the general population in general. Uh, so, uh, Joe, I think you're here to talk about it. Joe and Sean, I guess. Yes, Sean is here. Uh, I am as well. Tell us about it. Thank you for having us tonight. Uh, we appreciate it. I am going to share with you a quick PowerPoint presentation. Um, are you can can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Great. Thank you. Um, we're here tonight to talk to you, uh, as Member Brandt um, said, the Maplewood Lighting Project at the Walter Holt Field. Um, before I get into the project, I wanted to just start with a little local trivia. Um, and just throw out a question. Uh, keep the answer if you know it, but we'll visit this later. But what do uh, a boy who was born in Lancashire, England in 1895 and Russ Gibson um, of the 1967 Red Sox Impossible Dream Team have in common? So hold on to that. Uh, we'll revisit that at the end of the presentation. But I wanted to talk to you more about the uh, current Maplewood Park in the Walter Holt Field um, situation. Uh, the lighting uh, at the field at present time are wooden in structure with older lighting uh, sources at the top. Um, they've been around for a real long time. I couldn't uh, find the actual installation date, but from what I've been able to gather there, close to 50 years, if not over 50 years old. They're all wood and five of the seven structures have been deemed uh, a risk. So, you know, people who need to um, maintain them, change the bulbs, check them, no one can climb on the structure itself. The wooden poles are off limits. So that's problematic for us because we're forced to rent apparatus to get to the top to maintain the lights. Uh, not only that, but they pose a safety concern, you know, just with the wind today. Um, you know, I don't know how many days we want to have people out there in the course of the summertime with, with under this conditions. But that's what what's currently happening. The park itself is um, a center for aspiring athletes, recreational enthu enthusiasts of all varieties. The park has multiple surfaces. It has a full-size baseball field at the Walter Holt Field. It has two Cal Ripken fields. It has a wonderful playground. It has tennis courts, and it has a basketball court. Um, Maplewood, I mean, if you ever go by the park on a summer day, summer night, it is, you know, electric, you know, there's families, there's people playing ball, there's baseball games going on under the lights, it, 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 you know, there's people buying pizza, having takeout from across the street uh, at the, um, the um, plaza, it's just a real great place for family <clears throat> life throughout the summer. Um, since 1996, uh, Maplewood Park has been the center of operations for, as some of you know, uh, the Maplewood Independent Baseball League. Um, we've been serving the greater Fall River youth 
um, for, you know, since 1996 uh, and bringing them affordable, safe, fun baseball. And we do it from four to 18. So it, it's not uh, an exclusive league for just exclusive people. It's for everybody. And we, we welcome everybody to our league. Uh, the Walter Holt Field specifically is a current home for what our T-ballers and our, our rookies and our minors and our, our majors grow into. They grow into the, the Ledoux players, the Gordon Elite, American Legion, these teenagers who spent most of their life loving the game, spending their time in the park, and making memories with their families. Um, this is what's happening at the park currently. Uh, over 400 baseball players, ages 400 to 18, play at the park annually. Um, this, is, this is the kind of census we have at our league. Um, we're blessed to have this type, these types of numbers. Um, and it's not centralized to just Maplewood. I mean, people, uh, families come from the North End, South End, East End, West End. Uh, we have 90% of our uh, players are from Fall River, but we do accommodate for a variety of different reasons, whether it's family uh, issues, um, work-related, commuter-related, uh, people from outside um, of Fall River, but it's a very small percentage. Most of them are from Westport. We have some from Somerset and New Bedford. But again, it is 90% Fall River. Again, we offer uh, T-ball, rookie, uh, minor. T-ball is the uh, younger kids, four to six, then six to eight, uh, nine to 10, 10 to 11, and it goes up to um, right up to 18. So theoretically, you can spend your whole childhood at Maplewood Park. <laughs> and, and this has been going on for a very long time, not just since 1996 with us, but Maplewood Baseball League precedes all of us at this meeting by double. Um, the Walter Holt Field, again, is uh, utilized on a nightly basis during baseball season. I mean, every night those lights are on. We have people playing every night, not just the players, but the families. Uh, the benches are packed during the night with people watching their, their fans and parents and guardians watching their, their sons and daughters play baseball. Um, you know, so artificial lighting is a necessity. Uh, if the lighting system is not available, um, you know, hundreds of Fall River youth and families will lose a considerable amount of park access and utility. And I'm not exaggerating. Um, you know, over the course of, of five years, that park is going to see over hundred, hundreds of people. Uh, in, in, in a generation, it will see uh, probably close to maybe 1,000 kids will play on that field, not to mention all the people who come uh, as, uh, you know, accessories to, to, to their players. Um, you know, it provides a, a safe and positive place for the youth of our city to grow, develop, and create memories. This will, will be lessened if the lights are not replaced. Uh, and it also will diminish land for recreational use. And that's the core of CPA funding. It's one of the tenets of CPA funding is to, to, to fund the use of recreational lands to be used for recreation. And, you know, since 1910, this has been a center point of recreation in Fall River um, when it was um, uh, opened in 1910. Um, you know, by continuing to provide an adequate lighting source, we as a community, will continue to serve the youth of Fall River for generations. You know, this project isn't for this week or next week. This project literally has the opportunity to, af to affect people for generations, uh, five generations. Um, and again, we could, by perpetuating the well-lit, safe and accessible environment for recreation. Uh, the answer, you know, in our eyes, as we're advocating, is the removal and the replacement for the current lighting system. Uh, you know, I wanted to um, talk to you a little bit and just just highlight a little bit um, the 
active city-based organizational support that Maplewood, the organization that I represent, um, I just wanted to bring that to everyone's attention that our history um, with the park department, um, not only did uh, member Brandt, Chairman Brandt um, bring up that uh, the park department as the exhibit on the left um, shows that the park department and commissioner voted their, uh, in a regular meeting um, to support the project. Uh, and we've worked with the park department and city in the past with the installation of the Patriot uh, sponsored playground um, at Maplewood Park. Our members of our league physically helped install the apparatus there. Uh, our own free and volunteer time. That's how much we believe in this space. Um, we're a nonprofit organization. We believe in this space because we believe in the, the kids of our city. And we believe that they deserve that level of play and fun and organization. And uh, that's what we're, uh, we pride ourselves on. Over the last 20 years, the league has funded projects. Uh, just so you know, we're not just here saying, oh, we want you to help us with this project. We take the initiative and spend the time and raise the funds to make that city park better for everybody. And we've done that in, in, in a variety of ways. We purchased and install, installed lights on the lower Cal Ripken field. We renovate, and renovated and, and put additions on the concession sand, including a new bathroom at the Cal Ripken field. We've installed and uh, funded fences, installed new field sod in three of the fields, construction of new concrete shed um, at the Cal, one of the Cal Ripken fields. We also installed new batting cages at Maplewood. Uh, we purchased and installed uh, three new scoreboards um, for all the Maplewood fields. And, um, you know, these were things that were put on other projects that I've, uh, in, in some research, some uh, capital projects in, in 2016, when uh, it was mentioned that some of the things need to be done at Maplewood. We recognize that as, as a members or a group, an organization that uses that park all the time. Well, we want to give back. And, and these are the ways that we've, uh, tried to come to the table over the years and give back to that park because we see every year the effects of what that park does to, to the kids of our community. It, it's truly remarkable. Um, specifically, the Holt uh, Field Lighting Project. Uh, this is a run of um, the numbers, the cost breakdown. I believe this was a uh, part of... Uh, my submission. Um, this was a, an estimate that was provided to us by MESCO. Uh, there will be a more formal procurement process if we are uh, awarded this project where the city would have to, um, you know, do their official city procurement process. And this is, we wanted to just give you an idea of what um, MESCO, who is, um, you know, they're, I want to say they're the gold standard. And the reason why I say that is because every field I go on, I'm quite active in sports um, as, and I see their lights everywhere. So they're, they're pretty much the standard from what I understand. But uh, the cost um, it looks like this. Um, the type of category, I, I tried to list to make it easy. Um, the demo of this existing um, polls, would be 21,000. The pole disposal would be 13,500. Trenching and electrical work, close to 47,000, 48,000. The installation of the basis would be 50, 55,000 roughly. Installation of the poles, another 12. The material itself, uh, this is where all the technology is. Uh, the new technology in lighting and uh, the, uh, the engineering in lighting and the directional of lighting and the directions of the lights, it's phenomenal. And it will, high, it will really put the icing on the cake of that park. Uh, that's all 289,000. The tax, the con contingency costs, um, as you saw in the submission, the projected estimated total of 498,000. $564 is uh, requested 
from the committee to fund the project. Um, the timeline to the best of our ability with looking at these hypotheticals, we would be looking at, you know, uh, starting things uh, in August of 2021, if all things were uh, aligned and end the project uh, somewhere around, you know, March before the season, that would be ideal. Um, we would want to get things done um, prior to the season starting and, you know, putting on those lights and my, my it would be, it would be awesome to have the lighting ceremony. Um, I think it's, it's really would, so that's how the timeline works out. Uh, again, hypothetically with looking at what we know, um, we wanted to build something to at least have a guide and a plan. And I wanted to give you an idea of just uh, the differences in usage. Um, and you can see how the spikes in the usage of our uh, electric, um, which, which we pay, um, would, would be substantially different with new lighting. And this is based on estimates given to us um, from um, Musco in relationship to what the average savings would be or um, usage change would be based on old lights and new lights based on the conditions of what we have in the history of them doing this type of thing. Um, new lighting at the field, what does this all mean? Well, the beneficiaries of this project, the people who are gonna benefit the most are the current and the future kids, families, friends, fans who will utilize this valuable recreation resource on a nightly basis. I mean, again, I can't say that enough. If you're not familiar with the park, I, I recommend we're gonna be getting started soon. Um, take a drive by, uh, see what's happening there in the evenings and uh, see for yourself the benefit, who's gonna benefit from this. Additionally, uh, the local neighborhood. Um, Maplewood has been the gem of that of, of, the, of the South End uh, for a very long time. Uh, and it will continue to be, not only for that section of the city, but for the businesses that are there. Um, I mean, from the Brighton Avenue, the McDonald's, uh, Cumberland Farms down the street. I mean, we're always using those uh, concessions, quick serves all the time. Uh, we're there all the time. So I think everyone's gonna benefit uh, by this improvement. <clears throat> the ultimate goal uh, for the project is to ensure that the youth of our city, again, has a safe and well-lit recreational area at Maplewood Park. And that's, that's the bottom line is the safety. With what has happened at Lafayette, North Park, there's not many places that can even accommodate a night game of these of this sort um, with this many kids. Uh, so I think it's vital that this project is funded. Other benefits, um, and these are little uh, engineering type of uh, benefits. Um, glare problems because of the new lighting structures and the way they're, they're engineered. The light actually is directional lighting. Everything is focused on the field and it allows not only a better environment for the, the neighbors as far as the, the spill light with the light control, but as far as safety is playing, you know, high pops, uh, fast moving ground balls during the, during the night, well lit areas are safer to play. Um, structurally, the new uh, poles, these are guaranteed for 25 years. They have a 25 year warranty. We don't have to go and change the light bulbs. Those light bulbs are high efficiency LEDs. They last a lifetime. Uh, we can, we can shut the lights off and control the lights from a cell phone, from an app. We don't have to you know, go to the half of the pole and shut them off, shut them off if they have a problem. 
um, the cost savings just with the maintenance and the the um, the regular running of them is savings in its own over 25, 30 years. It will be tremendous. Um, now I wanted to get back to something I started the story with. These, these two, Russ Gibson and the boy born in Lancashire Shire, England in 1895. <clears throat> that boy was Mr. Walter Holt. He moved to Fall River and lived on Globe Street in 1904. He actually played baseball in 1915. His team was called the Pets and he played the Cubs at Maplewood Park in 1915. In 1918, he went off to World War I as many did. He served in the 71st Artillery Coastal uh, Corps in France. And luckily for all of us, he came back in 1919. He returned from France and he married uh, Ethel Williamson and he lived on Snell Street and actually was married to St. Louis Church. <clears throat> he organizes a team in 1922 composed of stars from the Winthrop Tigers. And a team, his team is known as the Mohegan the Mohegans of Maplewood. So he does this when he comes back from World War II. He played at Maplewood. He's like, I'm going to start another team back there. And he actually starts the original Maplewood Little, uh, the Maplewood Baseball League in 1922 as well. Just to run through this again, in the, in the late 20s, he was a founder of the American Legion Baseball team here in Fall River, the, the team when it, they started back in 1925. Uh, he lived on Mott Street. And he actually coached Russ Gibson, who also played at Maplewood Park and played at the top field. Uh, his, he has a field named in his honor, which we know we're here today seeking your funding for the field. We're seeking a, the funding for the field that's named in his honor that was dedicated to his name and he passed away at 92 years of age. Uh, his name was Walter Jigger Holt, as he was known. So what are these kind of random, you know, in my, it was like, in, in putting this together, it was so interesting. I was like, who's this guy? Who's this guy? I wanted to find out more about this guy this, this field was named after, because I was not familiar with him. And it's just amazing to see that this park that I'm talking to you about the future of has over a hundred years history. And in 1922, you know, this kind of thing, you know, or in 1919, 1999, when the park opened and shortly thereafter, the youth of our city was playing baseball there. These people share a special recreational area of the city of Fall River where they could spend countless hours playing a game they love and share it with the community. It was Maplewood Park and it's the Walter Holt Field. And I ask that we continue to light this park for the future of countless others of our city. Thank you very much for your time. I have a ton of uh, paper articles and, 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 and uh, historical documents from uh, the past that I was able to put together a story with. So I'll, I'll share those with you as well. But I thank you for your time and your consideration. <coughs> Sean and I will take uh, any questions at this point? <clears throat> oh, thank you, Joe. That was a good presentation. Um, I do want to say on your timeline, though, uh, it would have to wait till you got funded because you couldn't start before you got your CPC fund. So uh, just Correct. keep that in mind. For your <clears throat> uh, we'll open it up for questioning. Uh, Christine, any questions? Um, I, I don't have any questions, but I, I do want to say that you did an amazing job on this application, on this project. And if people in the future say, you know, how is an application, how should an application be done? How should a project be done? I'm going to use yours <clears throat> as an example of that because it's just, it's great. And your PowerPoint presentation was great too. 
Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And I couldn't have done it without the help of my board members and having the inspiration of the league that I'm proud to be part of. Uh, Vic, any questions? Uh, no questions. Just the same thing as Christine. I thought it was a great presentation and uh, great job. Yeah. Uh, Paul, any questions? Uh, my question was going to be who was Walter Holt? So thank you for answering that. <laughs> Uh, and uh, this is a great presentation, and this is a great proposal. Thank you. Uh, John, any questions? Uh, not so much a question, but uh, maybe just a, a little bit of relating to it. I've been, as you know, I've been coaching girls softball for 24 years, uh, and I was the president over at South Complex in Somerset for 11 uh, before coming to Fall River. Been at Durfee for 10 years uh, as the varsity coach there, and I still coach in uh, – in Fall River, a girls, uh, three girls travel teams. So I know the uh, I know the road. I know how hot it is to get fields. Uh, I hope he gets the lighting because we never did get lighting. Uh, we're still active, but it's uh, yeah, I agree. Also, great presentation. Um, I, you know, Joe did a good job, and uh, uh, again, I can relate to his uh, I can relate to his cause uh, on the female side, obviously, <laughs> but. Um, a uh, great job, and uh, you know, it's got my support. Okay, uh, Caroline, any questions? Uh, no, not at this time. But I, I do want to say that um, I definitely understand, as someone who's lived across the street from a baseball park my whole life, um, how important um, good lighting is, and as well as you know, not having the glare for the neighborhood. Um, and, and the safety of the lights is definitely important. Okay. Uh, Alex, any questions? Uh, I just wanted to echo the sentiments of my fellow members. It was a great application, a great presentation. Uh, my one question, I was wondering if you had maybe an estimate or a ballpark guess uh, on the amount of savings you would anticipate uh, from these lights compared to the ones you have now. I, I, I do, I do, I try, let me. Uh, it would be over a thousand dollars a season. Thank you. Thank you. Just to, just, to add to, just to add to that, just the savings on repairing the lights, uh, we no longer have to go up in the pole, as Joe mentioned, to replace bulbs because the LEDs, they have uh, diodes. So it's uh, just the savings over time would be tremendous just on the uh, repair, uh, repairing the lights and light bulbs, et cetera. Okay. All right. Uh, Danielle, any questions? No questions. Nice job. Okay. John, Hello, Joe? Yes. John, can I just interrupt Joe, uh, Joe Sandy Dennis? Can you forward me a copy of your PowerPoint so I can put it on file? And if any of the committee members want to refer to it during deliberation, they can? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Joe. You're welcome, Sandy. Thank you. Well, Joe, thanks for uh, doing your PowerPoint tonight. That was, like I say, one of the best uh, examples we've had of uh, somebody presenting a, a project. So uh, good luck. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, next up is the Fall River Museum. Um, we have, uh, well, this year you have roof replacement for 381,000, but we still haven't used last year's uh, funds of 172. Uh, I, I guess uh, Chris is gonna fill us uh, in on the, uh, on this. Yes. So back when this uh, was, was going on, um, this it started out with a particular architect as almost as Mark Ferrell did. Um, there may be some members here that uh, kind of understand what happened uh, with the previous architect. Um, so by the time it got into our hands and went that way, um, there was a, a piece to this building that it is a city building, it's a city entity. But at the beginning, they were doing this um, as if it was a private uh, company. So they weren't going through the procurement processes. 
Uh, they weren't prev paying prevailing wages. Um, things of that nature weren't, weren't happening. And um, so we, we kind of put a halt to everything to say, wait a minute here, this, this can't be done this way. Um, it, it is a city entity and it has to be taken care of through the procurement laws. Um, the other part of it was, again, the architect. So we had to bring on another architect uh, for them to get involved in this. Uh, in looking in, into that last year's budget, as you mentioned, that it hadn't been used yet, it's kind of grossly underfunded because of they thought it would be a private entity. So because of procurement and prevailing wages, the cost uh, 30 to 40% higher uh, on the prevailing wage um, when you start going that way, the procurement laws and what we have to do um, to get this. Uh, and also looking at some of this stuff, um, the previous architect didn't put anything in for hazmat, um, for asbestos. Uh, there has to be some hazmat testing here, um, especially on the windows. Um, the glazing usually around the windows and buildings of this age are, are full of asbestos. Uh, the roofing we know was replaced, but there could be flashing, there could be still some top paper, things of that nature up there that are, that are full, still with asbestos on them. So we really need to take a really good look at that um, before we go into that. Again, if you look at, at some of the last year's budgets, if you look at some of the, the pieces that they put in for um, that were very underfunded, um, they've got quite a bit in here and there's no possible way that any of this could be done. And it doesn't have, like I said, the hazmat piece. Um, there is no particular uh, chronological order in which way we, sh we should start and go ahead. Um, one of the things are is when you do a building of a historic in nature and stuff like that is again, start from the top down. Start at your roof line, go to your outsides, protect all of that stuff, and then you move into your interior work. Um, so he didn't have too much in, the, in, in, in that. Also, there's not much of what we see in here of structural. There is no structural engineering reports or anything like that. So in doing the roof, um, in looking at the, the in an existing conditions report uh, and not a full feasibility, there is really not too much in structural. I see in some of the photos, you can see there's been some patching and things of that nature, but that's not a full uh, structural analysis. So what we would like to do moving forward in talking with um, SIPTEC architects, uh, myself and Mike uh, LePage, um, is we'd like to be able to move forward with the roof and, and get the funding, but also utilize um, last year's money at the same time and try to not only um, clean up some of the existing condition studies so that the, the committee knows exactly what's going on in this building and exactly what needs to be done to this building, um, but also be able to do that hazmat analysis, um, being able to actually come up with specifications and documents um, to be able to put out for, for public procurement. Um, when you do a hazmat study, you don't only have the study and say, okay, yeah, you have asbestos here. You also have to write up a full and entire um, remediation. So when you find the hazmat, either it be in the glass, whether it be in the framing of the wood, whether it be uh, on the top paper on the roof, there has to be a specification on how it can be removed. And you have to have an LSP, you, you have to have it inspected. Um, you have to, when it's completed, uh, air analysis while it's being done. So all of these things have to kind of take place and he didn't have any of that in any of this. Um, so we would like to be able to basically almost combine the two, um, being able to utilize to do the roof, um, do as many of the windows as we can, but looking at it also is taking out on some of the things that he has. We have uh, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, about 13 items on that list of 174,000 in being able to put the fire alarm in there because there is no fire alarm. So to be able to do that, we would like to be able to do that as well because that's gonna protect this building. Um, as I was saying, you usually stop from the top down and work your way in, but we also wanna protect it from fire and that we've had quite a bit of vandalism at this building. We kids throw rocks through the windows and things of like that, they try to break in. Um, we have the uh, animal control next door. Um, they're concerned about somebody trying to break in and being that it's such an old building and no sprinklers, it's a wood structure. 
uh, we would like to be able to have a fire alarm in there. So we want to be able to combine basically the two funds to do a full um, full feasibility study so that we can come to the board and you'll know in a chronological order the things that need to be done. The things we're going to do is definitely going to do the roof and get the roof site. And we're definitely going to do some windows. We probably will not be able to do all of windows. If you look in here, uh, in the 2018 fundies, he's got $68,000 for the windows of this building. Um, that's probably grossly uh, underestimated uh, because of hazmat, because of what it would fall under the Secretary of Interiors. These windows would have to be um, preserved. So meaning they would have to, if there's any rot, they would have to inject some epoxies. Um, they'd have to get maybe some of the same species of wood and rebuild them. These are not windows we can um, replace with something new and more modern um, because they're, they're existing. And under the Secretary's interiors, if they're existing and they're original, we have to try to replicate them, rebuild them, or restore them. And that's what we're going to do going forward. Um, but this, this funding isn't going to be able to, to capture, capture all of that. But we will be able to capture quite a bit. We'll actually be able to give you a little bit more of a further investigation of exactly how much more it's going to cost to do. If we have 10 windows left, we have five windows left, or whatever we can do with the funds we have. Plus, you'll have more instead of uh, instead of like of an existing condition, you'll have more of a full feasibility study where um, you're allowed now to see in a chronological order of everything that's going to need to do with this building, what the costs are. And again, as I said earlier about the 4% escalation cost is usually the standard in the industry between four and 5%. You're gonna see going forward a projection on things when they come to you next year or anybody comes next year, you're gonna say, okay, they're gonna do this and it's gonna cost this amount of money. And then the year after you're gonna see what it's gonna cost. So when they come to you, you're already gonna have that full analysis, whether this committee is the same um, people on the committee or as the committee changes, they'll have a full understanding of, of what needs to be done to this building. Uh, it is a beautiful building. It does have some, some definite historic value to it. Um, and it, it'd be a shame not to do uh, any of the work that we're, we're looking to do to it. Um, uh, CivTech is now involved in it and they're ready to move forward, but with the blessing of this committee, we'll keep you informed on every step of the way um, before we even go out for bid. Um, and as soon as we get some studies done on the windows and stuff to see exactly what it is um, and things of that nature, same thing with the roof after we do our investigation and have our hazmat, we can come back to the board and say, okay, this is where we are. We can spend this money. This is what we're gonna get done for this money. And then moving forward and the next funding round of the next uh, committee, we would like to be able to kind of present to you um, what we're going to do. And at some point we'll have a completed uh, analysis and a completed study that we can give to the to the committee so that the, you guys will be able to see everything that's going to happen as we go along. So we'll be able to keep you informed. We're going to move this forward. Uh, COVID slowed us down. Uh, the previous architect slowed us down. Uh, changing from what we thought was, was private to public procurement um, kind of slowed us down. So from here, we are moving forward. We are going, but we are going to do it with the committee's blessing and we're going to do informing the committee every step of the way that we go along so that you would know exactly what we're doing when we're doing it. Uh, and at any point in time, you need us to stop. At any point in time, you, you're, you're okay with it. You'll, you'll give us the authority to move forward. All right. Uh, one question on this, uh, Chris, though. Uh, can you send us for our, our records uh, that this is a city-owned property and that the yeah. museum renting it for however you have that deal worked out for we have it on file? Yeah, I think it's a lease agreement. Um, I, I don't know, Mike, do you have the lease agreement? Do you know what the lease agreement is? If you can give me a copy of that lease agreement so that I can give to the committee. Or if Mike, if you have it, you can just send it to Sandy. I think, Mike, Mike, did you, Mike didn't you send that to us? Mike, you're, you're on you, mute. Mike, you're, you're on mute. mute. Unmute, Mike. There you okay. go. Okay, Mike, didn't yeah, you send us that lease agreement? Yes, I think I did in the past, but I'll be happy to send it again. Okay, all right. And then, Chris, what we need is 
the committee needs a formal letter stating that the issue of ownership's been resolved and the city, in fact, are the ones that own the building. Um, Not a problem. I'll get with Corporation Council as okay. well. Um, All right. I'll have my letter as well as Corporation Council, and I will do the same thing for the letter, uh, Chairman, at um, for Bank Street Armory removing um, it from this meeting. Okay. So Thank you, Chris. <clears throat> Yep. But Sandy, while I, while I have you, what did we approve uh, for what FY18? What was the... Uh... Okay, what I'll do is um, I will resend the entire committee uh, the project, the agreement, because Chris and Mike, the agreement hasn't been signed yet by yep. the party. No, yep. The no, agreement no, needs, yeah, the, the agreement needs to be rewritten because all the parties on the mm -hmm. signature page have changed since. So um, maybe you can bring this up during the deliberation meetings, um, but that original contract needs to be rewritten because of the signature page in the back. We have new corporation council, new chairs, um, just all new people since then. But I will get that. I'll send it to all the committee members because you have a lot of new committee people here. Chairman Brandon? Yes. Hi, it's uh, Michael Page. Um, so in, in regards to the document that Sandy's referencing, um, there was some errors in that wording. Uh, they mentioned masonry work. That wasn't even on. I don't know what happened, but that needs to be revisited too because it doesn't reflect what the application had on it. Sorry. Right. The masonry work has been done. Um, and Chairman, if I may, uh, just real quick, I can run through uh, some of the list um, that's uh, uh, it's in part of uh, what his funding agreement was. Uh, for number one, uh, provide historic actual wood, ADA sills and jams, trims uh, for the old boss stable, uh, first floor ADA compliant ramp, uh, stone pad, restore existing historic hay loft, uh, exterior illumination, emergency exit lighting, gutter repair and downspout, which we would do with the roof. Um, basement windows, caulk and trim the brick, weather stripping. Uh, when he talks about the basement windows and the brick, again, that should have some hazmat in there and it doesn't. Uh, operable windows at all elevations, window exterior trim and repairs, prep paint, demolition and cleanup of uh, dumpsters and fees, final brick and heavy cleaning, uh, which a lot of that has been done. They had washed the brick when they had did all of the brick masonry. Scaffolding for gutters and exterior. Um, I think that's gonna fall under the roof when they uh, do the roofing so that they'll have all of that already. Uh, <coughs> removal of all paint uh, and interior wood, encapsulate as required, I would assume for lead paints, but. Again, they haven't tested. I would just assume that it is, but they haven't tested, which we would be part of. Uh, repaint walls and ceilings. Uh, electrical upgrades, uh, sub panel, uh, new electrical wiring, uh, specialty fixtures for the museum lighting, fire alarm, and security alarm. Uh, the security alarm is something, and the fire alarm is definitely one of the key things we want to go on as part of this. Um, plumbing for the second floor bathroom. Uh, finishing off uh, for exterior hose. So some of this stuff that I'll take care of to my general uh, budget, but some of it um, uh, is, is we like to utilize, as I was saying, to do more of the study, the hazmat condition, um, because that's going to that's gonna be a substantial amount of money to be able to get those specifications so that we can put this off the bid. Um, because if we don't, if we go out to bid, it's going to be a substantial change when they don't have it and, and it's stuck because um, if you don't already document it, it's hard for the people to bid on it. And when it's a change order, it, it only seems to cost them more. And we also have to do a, a study the structural part of it. Like I said, that's not here. I know this committee, and I just want to make sure with the committee uh, before we end tonight, um, there was some talk about going back to slate roofing. Um, it'd be very, very difficult to do that because the structure uh, would probably require to today's standards and codes uh, a lot of reframing, uh, which I don't think is very necessary. They have a lot of asphalt products that are out there um, that look like slate that can give you that same design. Uh, we can actually send it to 
um, the historic commission. We can also send it to CPC um, for anybody to pick out. Um, and we can give them quite a few samples and send them around if we have to, uh, so that you know you, you can discuss it. Um, but I think uh, we're better off going with an asphalt, look like shingles type of thing. I think I've shown uh, the previous board uh, some products that we had. That one is like a dirt slate, and we have to look at that as far as we is concerned and what that may throw into the structural mix of this building. But the uh, asphalt shingles that are up there, putting asphalt shingles back and getting them to replicate that slate look. Uh, there's quite a few products out there that look pretty good and, and, and look nice from, from, the, from the ground and what we're gonna see. So uh, I just wanna make sure if the board is okay with doing the asphalt because going slate, I, I don't think it's, it's very cost prohibitive. Mike, any questions? You wanna... Uh... Yes, um, I totally agree with Chris's assessment. Um, just a little quick history. This. Funding for 172 that was asked for and approved. Um, that funding was based on a conversation I had with the previous architect, and we were trying to we were trying to get the museum open on fast track. So I said to the architect, "What does it going to What is it going to take to get the museum open to the public?" And he came up with this: several items, interior, exterior. Um, I, re I recognize the fact that he was off on his numbers. We know that now. Um, but Chris is correct. A lot of the, some of this work was already completed through other funding and or through, um, you know, work that my own guys have done, uh, volunteer work. Okay. All righty. Uh, Christine, any questions? Um, I don't have any questions. I just, I'm waiting to see the, um, the, 2018 request and and what exactly we approve because we if we approve certain things and then they go and do them on their own <clears throat> then it's not like you can just transfer the money over to do something else we approve it for certain things and that's what that money needs to be used for right. so i think we need to um before we can well, even do anything just figure out exactly what we approved and what's been done, what still needs to be done. So the only thing I think that really has been on here that um, that's like probably been done is the final final brick heavy duty restoration cleaning. So when they repointed the building, they did it, and um, the architect had seven seventeen hundred and eighty dollars. Um, I'm gonna go back up. Uh, that's been done, and the other page. Um, so, uh, plumbing rough in second floor bathroom. Um, that has been done, and that was only thirty eight hundred. So, those are two items. Um, the rough on the second floor has been done and the um, final brick have been done. Some of the other stuff we, we can, we're going to, to do ourselves, uh, some exterior lighting um, of that nature, what we could do ourselves in exterior lighting, what do they have? Uh, uh, okay, all right. that are on here which were a small amount and we have to rewrite this agreement anyways which we could take those two items out of there because we're going to rewrite it because of all the new committee members <clears throat> myself and mike need to sign so if, if we take those two items out and then we got to do the new signature page anyways that's what we need to do. okay so we'll still be looking to do some of that funding and we would like to maybe be able to change it and put it more towards the hazmat that isn't in there, so if they go by them, I'll put the hazmat in there that needs to be there and some of the structural study and stuff like that if we could. 
Yeah, but if well, that wasn't what was approved in the first place, you can't just change stuff out and then put new stuff back in. That's well, what I'm saying. We, the committee approved about, certain things. I so think we're there's, to... what we're going to have to do on uh, the 172 is uh, probably table that to the next meeting and we'll look over the agreement and we'll go from there on that. So we'll just try and keep this one tonight yeah. to That's just. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what I'll do, Kristen, John, and committee members, is I will work with Alex Mello and try to get the deliberation and meeting of the vote from that project date. Then I will match what the committee at the time recommends for the itemized pieces versus the contract and Mike versus the funding agreement. Because a lot of times the committee might approve certain things that weren't even on the funding agreement as their recommendation. So what I'll do is I'll go back and I'll try to find those meetings, look at them versus the agreement that was written out so that we know exactly what the committee voted to recommend to the city council versus what's on there. And then you can revisit it at the next meeting as a separate agenda item outside of deliberation, okay? Is that okay with you all? Sounds good. Yeah. All right. Uh, Vic, do you have any questions? Just uh, stick <clears throat> to the roof. Mike has a question. Not right now. Mike had his hand up, LePage, Mike? John. Yeah, go ahead, Mike. So just for clarification, um, I understand that the, uh, the funding agreement um had some grammatical errors in there uh but i would argue that the 172 930 that we requested on the application was the exact amount that was on the funding agreement so in my mind everything that was listed on those 10 exterior items and four interior items was all included um, and then one other comment, the number five, the re restoration of the windows. I know he doesn't have it broken out, but the $68,980 for the restoration of the windows, um, he doesn't have the hazmat, but that was included in that as part of the restoration of the windows. So again, arguably, it's not like we're doing something outside of the cuff. It was part of that $68,980. Uh, $68, Okay, that's, we, we just wanna make sure we're on the same page with Chris and you, that way we know what direction and what's being done. Um, okay, uh, Paul, any questions? No. Uh, John, any questions? Uh, yeah, just one. I know we're talking about uh, the um, gutter repair and downspout repair. Chris, are, they, uh, are we replicating the copper flash and the step flash and gutters and downspouts and such? We would. We would have to, we would have to under the Secretary of Interior standards and stuff like that. And there already exists. So what could be repaired would be repaired. And if not, what isn't would have to be replicated. My only thing of it is, is that probably the last 10 feet of it be a copper lookalike because we all know what happens here in the city. And that last 10 feet, if it's real copper, it won't, it won't be. Yeah, no, I, I agree 100 percent there. So uh, we would do something to that effect, uh, probably for that last 10 feet of that um, system. Yeah, no, I agree 100% because it'll be missing um, in a blink of an eye. I just noticed yeah. all the uh, copper step flash and events and downspouts and such. Yeah, we have we have to follow Secretary of Interior. And if it's there and it's existing, we have to either repair or replace to, to that. And just to the note is, is that when I did the Bank Street Armory, we did the lower room. Um, the Secretary of Interior allowed us to take some of the copper that was within the uh, walls of, of the roof that you can't see from the street. So that copper um, is going to stay with us. Uh, it will not be sold with the uh, existing building. Um, and we have skylight from the original, uh, from Central Fire Station, which will come with us, will not stay in that building. And we'll be able to utilize that copper for buildings that we may have that we need to replicate because it has that same patina green look that takes a while for top of the turn and stuff. Right. So as we repair things, it kind of blends together and it doesn't look like it's a repair. Yep. 
All right. Thanks, Chris. All right. Uh, Alex, any questions? All right. Yeah, I had a question. I'm just trying to get a little clarification, and it might be just because I'm <coughs> still a new member and I wasn't around for the previous funding agreement. But when we talk about rewriting the FY19 funding agreement for 172,000, and then we have the application this year for 381,000, is those, are those all separate work or are you rewriting the FY19 application to combine it with this year's application for like a combined scope of work type thing? I'm just a little fuzzy on where the FY19 project starts and where this application's where our proposed work begins. Well, one of my suggestions was to try to combine it, but it, it's whatever the committee feels that they would like to do. Um, there are things that we're going to do that is there, and with the, the roof of what the new application is, we're going to stay that as, as that project. That's the roof, and we're going to go that way. The previous one, because of all of the things that happened, there's some typos in it, there's some things in it that shouldn't have been in it. There are uh, some reasons of what from the previous architect didn't do it right, didn't have the hazmat or the structural in there, I was asking the committee if they would entertain that offer. So it's going to be up to the committee and their deliberation uh, in which way they will want to go with it. Uh, I would like to be able to use it in conjunction with the roof, complete some of the things in this list, but also add to that. But again, it's up to this committee. That, that I have to leave to the committee. I, I can't force them to do anything that they don't want to do. But we do have to rewrite some of this anyways, and we do have to redo the signature page with everybody on there. And <clears throat> for transparency, everybody knows um, basically, you know, what, what has happened with the FY18, 19 uh, piece so that everybody knows where we stand and what we're doing moving forward. So, Alex, we'll uh, revisit that. Uh, we're going to uh, look up the uh, FY18, see what's in the agreement, and we'll talk about that at the next uh, meeting we have. Thanks. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, Carolyn, did I already ask you if you have any questions? Uh, me, you didn't, but no, I don't have any. Okay. Uh, Danielle? No, I don't. Okay. All righty. Um, well, thanks for uh, we'll look this over and uh, we'll make a decision on FY18 and we'll go from there. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. Thank you very much. Uh, next on the agenda is deed restriction funding uh, for, for newer members. What this is uh, put in for is um, in the past, we haven't put uh, taken money out of the applicant for deed restriction, legal fees. Uh, so this is what this is going to cover, but we have to break it down into historic, historic preservation, open space, uh, recreation and housing. So we're probably going to, Paul, did you want to? Talk about this? Um, well, we just discussed it at the last meeting. I don't have any updates. I do plan on uh, trying to make arrangements with the um, Corporation Council um, to get some further clarification, but I haven't done that. Okay. Uh, and, and yes, for each project, the deed restriction going forward in each um, for each funding amount will be related to the um, area, either the historic preservation, outdoor recreation, etc. So this will be broken down, but it's not broken down now because I didn't know how many past, um, how many past restrictions we have. Okay, uh, Christine, any questions? No. Okay, Vic, any questions? No. All right. Uh, John, any questions? No. Okay, Alex? No. Okay, Caroline? No. All right, uh, Danielle, any questions? No. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, our next meeting is uh, where you can put on your record is uh, April 8th. That's gonna be deliberation. Now, uh, this is gonna be a meeting where we go over all the projects and this is a good time to look them over and uh, mark on them like um, what we're going to cover, what it's going to entail uh, that we give them, what's the money used for. So uh, we want to be a little more uh, exact this year and are describing how they're going to use the money and what it's going for. Uh, then April 22nd, we'll do our voting to see what projects move ahead. 
Um, so can I have a motion to adjourn? Make a motion to adjourn. Second. A second. All right, meeting adjourned. No roll call, John. Oh, sorry, sorry, roll sorry, I forgot roll call. <laughs> uh, let's see, Kristen Oliveira? Yes. Uh, Victor, Victor Ferris? Yes. Paul Machado? Yes. John Ferrer? Yes. Alex Sylvia? Yes. Carolyn Auburn? Yeah. Danielle Pixley? Yes. John Brandt, yes. Meetings adjourned. Bye. Bye. Good night, everyone. Good night. Bye.